In high school, he almost got expelled because he was leading a revolt against the principal. Please welcome Hamdan. Thank you, Jared. Thank you to the New York Art Conference for having me back. Uh, it's my second year here. Who was here last year? By a round of applause. A lot of folks, very cool. Very, very, very excited to be back. Um, so last year I came here, I spoke about my work in emoji data science, which is a, a big passion of mine. That's one of my, uh, that's me at the world's first ever emoji conference, EmojiCon. Um, you, you have to hold these emojis and they take pictures of you. It's, it's really cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, today I wanted to take a step back and talk a little bit about sort of my thoughts on the field and kind of like what really excites me and gets me passionate about data science because I've kind of been, it, been in it for a little while now and it's just something that I'm deeply passionate about. Um, so last year, yeah, I talked about emoji data science. Uh, I did the world's first study on the peach emoji. Um, that's one of my claims to fame. Um, I think that's Mashable or one of, the, one of those outlets. Um, I... Yeah, I mean, that's what I found, basically. If you want to know how the peach emoji gets used, that's how it's used. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very cool. No one would have expected that. Um, and then you can also look at the emojis people use with the peach. No surprise, it's the eggplant. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I also did some work on the Taylor Swift-Kanye West feud. I don't know if you guys were familiar with that. That was a big thing, like, I think, six, seven years ago. I don't know who ended up winning. I, I guess, I don't know, Kanye? Round of applause. No? Taylor? Taylor? Everyone loves Taylor? OK. Yeah, Kanye went off the deep end. Anyway, um, I looked into that. I documented the world's first ever instance of snake bombing. That's when people started leaving the snake emoji comment on Taylor's profile on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, Instagram actually banned the snake emoji for 48 hours because it was a case of cyber bullying, um, kind of wild stuff. But you know, today I really wanted to take a step back. I want to start at the origin. So this is me in high school. Um, I actually just found this picture. I went to the Bronx High School of Science here in New York. I don't know if any New York natives in the house. Um, very nerdy school. Um, as you can tell, that's how I dressed in high school. <laughs> today, I they made me leave the jacket because they're like, it's 100 degrees. You got to, you know, you have to relax a little. And uh, I have had a lot of coffee. And that's me in high school, you know, studying R, right? No, that's not true. I'm not that old. But, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of been in this field for, you know, a while. Uh, Back in, uh, I end, I, let me sort of, okay, where, where am I going to go? So I've been in this field a while. So I think for me, it's really interesting to consider what data science is like today and how it started out when I got into it. So these are two quotes that I really like. Um, you know, one is from Eric Fromm, who's a great 20th century psychologist, philosopher. He talked about how we're enmeshed in a net of means and we've lost sight of the ends. We have all of these incredible tools, but we don't really know what to use them for. And the second one is this very famous quote by Jeff Hammerbarker, where he talked about how the best minds of our generation are thinking about how to make people click ads. And the reason why I always found these quotes so poignant and pertinent is because it seems that today, increasingly, data science is being reduced to a set of tools, a set of powerful tools, but we're not thoughtful enough about, now that we have these tools, what do we do with them? So I don't know if you guys have seen a data science resume these days. Um, I hire a lot, and you know we get like 300 resumes, and almost all of them have a box like this. Like, I guarantee it. Pe I'm seeing people nodding. Your resumes have a box like this. I don't blame you. Everyone does, right? And it's like this box of all of these buzzwords that, like, you have to put on your resume because everyone's like, this is data science, and you have to know all of these tools. And I don't even know what data stage is. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what Seaborn is. I, I guess it's cool. Cognos. So you're like, all of these, all these mumbo jumbo words when, like, for me, data science is actually about solving problems. It's about finding insights. It's about learning something about how the world works. Um, it's about pursuing our deepest curiosity. And you know, I think in the old days when you would ask people, why do you want to become a data scientist, the types of answers they would give would be very big picture answers. They'd be like, I want to understand how stars get formed, and I want to understand why some societies succeed economically, why others fail. Like, I want to, they would come up with really powerful answers. And now when you ask people, why do you want to become a data scientist, they give you a list of tools like this, right? Like, I want to do this, I want to do this. And it's like, there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that. But I just wanted to sort of walk you through a little bit of my journey and 
I think what I find so powerful about the promise of data science, and I don't know if you guys remember, there was this article in Harvard Business Review in 2012 that sort of kicked off a lot of this passion for data science. That's when they called it data scientist, the sexiest job of the 21st century. Um, no one in my family knew what data science was before then. I sent this to my family, I sent it to all my friends, and they were like, wow, that's so cool. You're a data scientist, now we get it. Um, because back then, really, people didn't really know what it was. And if you go back and read those articles, the vision of data science is very different from this sort of toolbox data science that, that we have today, where back then, Hal Varian, who was Google's chief economist, essentially their chief data scientist, he talked about how the power of data science is the ability to understand data, process it, find value in it, visualize it, communicate it. He's not talking about machine learning over here. He's not talking about deep learning. He's not talking about AI. Now, a lot of those tools have developed recently. They're very powerful tools. But I think the original vision of data science was much more holistic. It was much broader. It was much more human-centric. It was really about human beings. It was about people. It was about finding important questions and answering them. And you know, this is what got me into the field. So I, I dug up my statement of purpose when I applied to grad school. And uh, you know, this is what I wrote in that statement. It was about data sets telling me their stories. It was about understanding the world. And that is what you know, I found so powerful about it. And I think a lot of people today don't fully appreciate that data science is deeply human. You know, this is sort of how I view that data science process, where it starts out by finding a problem to solve. And then you find the data to answer this question. You clean the data. You analyze the data. You build models. You do some technical stuff. And then you have to tell a story. You have to use that story to have impact. If you look at these you know, steps in the data science process, um, the vast majority of these are actually really deep human skills. right? There is no uh, Python notebook that's going to tell you how to find a good problem to solve. Right? There's no library that's going to tell you how do you find the data to answer your question. Um, and I think this is what really um, excites me about data science. And this is sort of what I want to bring back to the audience and sort of share a little bit about my journey um, and how I've done this throughout my career. And I think going back to the, permit, the title, right? data science is permissionless. The reason I say that is because so many people are always asking, how do I become a data scientist? How do I break into data science? Like, open your LinkedIn any day. There's like 20 kids right, messaging me, like, how do I do it? How do I do it? I, I don't know how to do it. And it assumes that there's this massive barrier to entry to becoming a data scientist. Um, data scientist is not like brain surgery, where you need, to, you need someone to let you operate on their brain to become a brain surgeon. Right? You can't just become a permissionless brain surgeon. It doesn't work like that. Um, if you want to go out and build bridges, like you need someone to hire you to build a bridge. And you need a lot of raw material. You need a lot of resources. Um, you, need, you need stuff. right? You need permission to be a bridge builder or a brain surgeon. Um, if you want to do data science, you actually don't need anyone's permission. You can do it. That's it. right? And that, that, that was sort of was always my ethos. Um, you just need to go out and find data. And data is more freely available today than it ever has been which is incredible. Um, and you just need the tools to analyze that data. And we have a lot of powerful tools. Uh, R, which is what brought us all together, is a powerful open source tool that allows you to find incredible value in data, um, which is why I think we need to shift this mindset of you know, how do I enter data science and how does someone give me a chance? Data is everywhere, right? It's, it's all about you um, and finding value in that data. And I think this really hit home for me when you know, my younger sister came to me about you know, 10 years ago now. And she told me, I want to become a community organizer. But I keep applying to these community organizer jobs. And they all want five years of experience. They want recommendations from politicians. Like, how do I become a community organizer? And I was just like, why don't you just go organize a community? <laughs> right? I was, she was like, what? I can do that? I was like, yeah, core community organizer. Organize a community. She's like, wow. And then she went out and did that. And now she works in public policy at Google. I'm very proud of her. But it's like, that's how it begins. It's about. Take shifting our mindset from, you know, there are these gatekeepers, and you have to jump through all these hoops. Um, and data science is one of these fields where it's really, really powerfully true. So data is all around us. The tools to understand this data are widely available, open source, well documented. The community is fantastic. So then the question is, where do you start? OK, like that sounds really intimidating. You just want me to go out and do data science. What does that mean? That sounds really scary. And for me, the answer has always been start with your passion. Start with things you care about. Because the skills you have as a data scientist are not just for you to do your day job and be great at that, which we do the, all of that, and that's incredible. They're there to help you pursue your curiosity and find the answers to questions that you care about. Um, that's what this skill set enables us to do. And I think that's really, that's really powerful. 
So, you know, I've had a wide and varied and, you know, kind of wild journey across my career. I started out uh, getting a master's in biostatistics. I dropped out of a, P a neuroscience PhD program. Um, I've worked in politics. I've worked in advertising. I've worked in emojis. Um, I've worked in finance. I've kind of done all of these crazy things. But for me, I think a lot of us, when we think about the arc of our career and what motivates us, for me, the common thread has always been we have a lot of data and we have no idea what to do with it. That's like every job I've ever walked into. Every interview I've ever walked into, we have a lot of data, we don't know what to do with it. Again, today I think that scares people, because I was reading on Blind, if you go in an interview and someone says that to you, run as fast as you can. Um, but for me, like, that got me excited, because it meant like, okay, I get to build something from the ground up. These people have a lot of data, they have no idea what there is to do with it. Let's start, let's find stories in this data, let's find value in this data. And that actually got me, it got me really excited and really helped drive my career. So today, you know, in the nine minutes I have remaining, I want to walk through very quickly some examples in my career of how I've used data science to pursue my curiosity. I'll talk a little bit about my work in politics, my work in emojis, and then lastly, this project on news deserts, um, and we'll call it a day. So has anyone here worked on a political campaign, volunteered on a political campaign? A few people? Yeah? How was it? You loved it? I changed my major. You changed your major? Yeah. From what to what? Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Very cool. Not, the, not what I was expecting. Um, so I worked on a political campaign. So this was uh, 2012. Um, I was a research assistant at Columbia Business School. I just dropped out of my PhD program trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I get an email. Ron Paul is having a, a winter program in Iowa for people to come out and volunteer for the caucuses. And this was right in December break. It was holiday break. I loved Ron Paul, right? I don't know if any Ron Paulers in the house, any libertarians. Um, boo, OK, that's cool. Um, uh, I think back then, you know, I really liked that he wanted to end the war. He was pro-civil liberties, like things that were very important back in that period in American history. And I'd never been to Iowa. Like, I grew up in New York. I grew up in Brooklyn. I'd never been to Iowa. I imagined, like, it was going to be beautiful cornfields and snow everywhere. That is what Iowa looked like when I got there. There was no snow anywhere. It was, uh, it was empty. There was literally nothing around. That's literally a picture I took on my second day in Iowa. Um, so I get to Iowa, and it's a, it's a campaign, right? It's a, it's a call center, essentially. I walk in, and there's a phone. We used to call them phone banks, but essentially it's a call center. You have 100 volunteers, and all they do is call voters all day. Hi, I'm a volunteer. Uh, if the election were held today, who would you vote for? Uh, Mitt Romney, Ron Paul, Newt Gingrich. Uh, what issue is most important to you? Healthcare, the war, veterans' rights. How likely are you to vote? They're essentially polling voters. Um, and I walked in, you know, as a volunteer. So they're like, okay, grab the phone, get to work. And here I am, you know, master's statistician. Um, but I did it. I did it for a day. And then I walk up to the guy at the front of the call center, and I, I, I basically gave him my resume. I said, listen, I'm a statistician. I don't know if you saw Moneyball. Like, we, I can really help you guys turn this around. Uh, my skills are being underutilized on this phone calling grandmas in Iowa. Like, let, let's, get, let's get rolling, you know? And, and he had no idea what I was talking about. He looked at me like I was from Mars. Um, this was 2012. It was way before big data politics, Obama, all of that. Um, and he had no idea what I was talking about. That was like a very eye-opening moment for me, because it was like, you can't just, you have to show people what you can do for them. You have to actually show it to them, because otherwise they have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so I went back, he, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I'm sure you're really smart. Um, I have an idea for just the thing you can do for the campaign. I was like, yes, yes. He's like, make some calls. So I, <laughs> so I spent three days making calls in that phone bank. And then I went up to him again, and I said, um, I can tell you how we can win this election because I can tell you what issues voters care about. I can tell you what parts of the state we're performing well in. I can even tell you who are the highest performing volunteers in this call center. I can tell you where Ron Paul should visit next because these are the parts of the state where we're about to beat Newt Gingrich. Like, I can give you all of that. And it was like his mind exploded. He was like, what? Like, what? You can do all of that? And I was like, yeah, I can do it. And he said, where's your computer? Log in right now. And that's how I became the national statistician in Ron Paul's campaign, um, literally. And uh, my SAS license had expired because you know SAS was this old software, legacy software back in the day. Still around, still around. Um, my SAS license had expired. And I had like take, I, one of my professors had like covered R a little bit. So literally in the phone bank in Iowa, I downloaded R. I taught myself how to use R on the Ron Paul campaign in Iowa with that guy standing over my shoulder. Because after I logged in, every 30 minutes, he's like, did you find something? Did you find something? Did you find something? How are we going to win? How are you going to win? How are you going to win? 
And it was just an incredible experience because I literally created that position for myself out of nowhere. And then I had all of this data. Uh, we started reporting on that data. This is what a dashboard looked like in 2012. <laughs> That's literally a dashboard where we, have, we would update it every hour on how many calls we had made and what our support rate was and what counties we were doing the best in. Um, and it was, it was just incredible, right? And then we ended up... Um, the screen going blank. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, so we had, a, these are Ron Paul's granddaughters. So one day, so I basically started building reports. Um, I, no, I'll tell you why that's funny. Because I started building reports on who the most successful callers in that phone bank were. And I would just run this report every hour. And then they would announce the results. And all the kids would start jumping up and down. Because I was like, you know, these are the kids who made the most calls. These are the kids who got the people to answer the most surveys. These are the kids who were most effective at persuading people to vote. And I would just run this every hour. Um, and then I would start building these reports. And we had that whiteboard dashboard. And then the, the head of the phone bank, he came to me one day and he said, I want you to put stickers on every single volunteer in this phone bank with their statistics to motivate them to perform better. So that's the sticker I am modeling on my suit. It has my name. It has how many calls I've made. It has my percentile ranking in that phone bank. Because I gave him the printout, and he said, take a marker, take a volunteer, put a sticker on every kid in this phone bank. That way he can know who's performing the best. It was wild for me coming out of grad school where, you know, like it's very slow. It takes four years to write a paper. Everything is like so slow. And here I am. I came up with an idea. I wrote 10 lines of R, and now every kid in this phone bank in Iowa is wearing a sticker with numbers that I came up with on my computer. It was wild to me. Um, and it was just fascinating, right? Because it was like I got to do all of that from scratch. Um, it was an incredible experience. Eventually, you know, we found the top volunteers in that phone bank. We took them across the country with us. Um, we took them across the country. These are the top. Like, we literally traveled the country. And eventually, we started doing cooler stuff. We started looking at maps. We started doing more geo-targeting, looking at, you know, where in the state we were performing best. By now, I'm sure there's all these softwares for all of this. But back then, this was literally just me hacking it together in R. And I think that was such an incredible, rewarding experience for me because literally it was just me taking something I was passionate about, finding data, and doing stuff with that data. And that ended up like opening so many doors for me. I had so many interviews where anyone would just ask me, what is Ron Paul like? How, what was it like working on the campaign? I had no technical interviews, basically. Those were my interviews. I would walk into a coding interview, and the guy would just be like, what is Ron Paul like? It was wild, 2012, fun days in data science. Um, but I think that's sort of like the story here is that these opportunities are all around us. Like there are things that you're passionate about where there's data, where you can add value to the world, you can find insights, you can learn about stuff, and that's just incredible. Um, I want to talk briefly about my work in emoji. So again, I did a lot of work in emoji data science. But I, that also started kind of very randomly at a whim. I was working at Facebook. My day job was kind of boring. I was doing ads research, working with advertisers and ad agencies, falling asleep in meetings. And one day I figured out, we have a lot of text data at Facebook. I'm, I want to figure out what are the top emojis people use on Facebook. And I started poking around in SQL and Hive. It turns out it's actually quite difficult to answer that question, back then at least, because Hive would garble the Unicode encoding of the emoji, so you couldn't really pull them out. So then I started Googling, how do you work with emoji data? And every single NLP library I found, the first line was hashtag remove emojis and emoticons. And I was like, OK, this is not what I need. But this was also an eye-opening moment for me. I was like, if everyone is removing the emojis, maybe I should study only the emojis. And that's what I ended up doing. Um, and it was kind of incredible. So Facebook ended up filing a patent on uh, emoji machine learning based on, uh, based on this work which is really cool. Um, basically, this is the foundation of emoji recommendation now. So in your phone, when you type in a word, it shows you an emoji. This was the early work that sort of guided that, that science behind it. Um, I ended up doing a lot of work on emojis. I looked at the emojis um, after Brexit happened. Um, and uh, here are the top emojis when Brexit happened. Kind of like really basic work. I, I, you know, I found that when people are happy about Brexit, they use the party hat emoji. When they're sad about it, they use the crying face emoji. Stuff that's like super obvious to everyone in this room. But back then, here, here's the thing. Here's the critical insight. Most, almost all data scientists in the world thought emojis were stupid. Almost everyone who was passionate about emojis was not a data scientist. I was the only one who was a data scientist who loved emojis. And that kind of became my, my, my competitive advantage. And it was, it was just incredible. I did the Kanye West Taylor Swift thing. I looked at emojis on election day. Uh, this clicker is really annoying. I'm going to stand here. I looked at emojis on election day. So on the right, you have emojis that, are so, that people use when they were talking about Donald Trump. 
On the left, you have emojis that people use when they're talking about Hillary Clinton. Again, you're really able to capture the emotional state of a nation um, by finding value in data. This is R code. Everything on this chart is R. And you can find it on prismoji.com. I have a GitHub. By now, it's like eight years outdated. I think Twitter took down their API, so it's probably too late to become an emoji data scientist using Twitter data. But I'm sure you guys are smart and can figure something out. But it was just an incredible, incredible journey. Um, this, are, this is what the middle finger emoji means. Um, in case you guys were wondering, I'm waiting for my uh, honorary PhD in linguistics because of this. Um, it's, coming, it's coming any day now. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, basically, I really want to encourage you guys um, and motivate you that the best way to become a data scientist is to do data science and start with something you're passionate about. Build some cool stuff. Share it with the world. You got this. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure being here.